excited. So, all right, let's, uh, uh, let's begin with prayer. Our great Father in heaven, thank you for the day we have, uh, the beauty of the world, and what we get to enjoy with the good weather. And uh, God, we're just always so thankful to you. Uh, you are a constant provider of blessings. And when things are great, uh, Lord, we are thankful. And when things are difficult, we are reminded how much we depend on you to get us through difficult times. And God, help us today as we continue to study the story of the Exodus. Help us to remember uh, not just the uh, incredible power of the ten plagues, but also to remember that you are the power behind them, that you we're doing your work and accomplishing your will, and help us to always look for what that will might be in our lives. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. All right, so we are continuing on Exodus chapter 5. If you want to open your Bibles there, Exodus chapter 5. And we'll be going through nine of the ten plagues. Uh, chapter 12 will be the tenth plague, and we'll save that for Wednesday night. Uh, but we will go Exodus 5. 5 through 11 today is the plan. So we kind of left the children of Israel in Egypt. How are things going for them? Not too good. I would agree with that assessment, right? What, what's wrong? What's wrong with their lives? Okay, so they're enslaved. Uh, they, they have been tasked by the Egyptians or by the rulers of the Egyptians to build buildings, to make bricks, to accomplish those tasks. And uh, part of the reason for that is uh, they are uh, not Egyptians. They're kind of foreigners living in the land or living you know, uh, at the edge of the land type thing. Part of it is we've got, as uh, explained in chapter 1, there is a new, new pharaoh of some sort or a new dynasty that does not remember the services of Joseph and so doesn't really care about the Israelites. And then part of it is also what? What's the concern of the, of the royalty of Egypt? There's so many of them that they're a danger. So essentially we need to keep them oppressed and under control and that, you know, apparently enslavement is the way to accomplish that task. Well, we know God raised up Moses, but not necessarily the way human logic would defend that. You know, Moses, as a 40-year-old man, went to essentially rescue the people, deliver the people. It did not go well. He ran, and then 40 years later, he has his... Um, his burning bush experience. And what does God tell Moses at the burning bush? You're going to deliver the people. And Moses' response is, yes, the time is here, right? Not at all, right? He's very hesitant. He's making excuses. He does not believe he is the right man for this job. But of course, God steps in and says, go get to work, go do the job, and gives him what he needs. And so he goes back to the people, and the people go, yes! Well, they actually do right at the beginning. Now, that doesn't last very long, as we'll see in chapter 5, but if you look back in Exodus chapter 4, Exodus chapter 4, somebody read verse 27 through the end of the chapter. Aaron spoke all the words that the Lord had spoken to Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. And the people believed, and when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel and that he had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and worshipped. Okay, so uh, and at the outset of this, the people of Israel are on board, right? Uh, but we get into chapter 5 and we realize uh, we start to see the fickleness of the people. The fact of they're, they're on board when things are going their way. But when things aren't going their way, what's their immediate reaction? Moses. 
Yeah, they, they start pointing fingers. They blame Moses. Moses is in here stirring up trouble. They no longer believe Moses. Uh, they, you know, I, I would even dare say they no longer really have their faith in God and what God is going to do. Uh, you, you have pretty much a, a denial of what is going on here. So uh, we'll see that as we move through the chapters uh, that we have assigned for us today. So Moses confronts Pharaoh, basically says, um, essentially, this is what the Lord said, let my people go so that they may hold a festival for me in the wilderness. Now, I'm going to, I'm just, without making too big of a deal about this, oftentimes what Moses says to Pharaoh seems like a watered-down version of what God has said to Moses. What is God wanting to happen? What has God promised? Deliverance, and I'm taking you back to your promised land. Is that what Moses asked for here? No. What Moses says is, let us go out in the wilderness and have a festival, a celebration, a worship service. And multiple times early on in this plague process, that's what you see Moses asking for. Give us three days journey out into the wilderness so that we can worship our God and then we will essentially come back. And that is not, um, again, maybe I missed it in there somewhere, very possible, uh, but you know, God isn't asking for a festival. God is bringing deliverance, right? Now again, I'm not saying Moses is lying. This very well could be the plan that God put together with Moses, that this is how we're going to stair-step this thing in the eyes of Pharaoh in order to accomplish God's will. God knows that Pharaoh is going to be stubborn. God knows that Pharaoh is going to say no. And God wants Pharaoh to say no. The reason we know that is, there's a couple of places. Um, one, uh, just a little bit outside of our reading for today, but somebody turn to Exodus 12 and verse 12. Exodus 12 and verse Okay, so part of what God is intending here is to display his power over the supposed gods of Egypt. Okay, God wants the opportunity to display power. Part of the reason for that also, uh, going back into our section, you've got God speaking to Moses before the first plague, and he says there, verse, this chapter 7, verse 4, Pharaoh will not listen to you, but I will, put, I will put my hand into Egypt and bring the military divisions of my people, the Israelites, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. Now listen to this, verse 5. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the Israelites from among them. You know, God knows that Pharaoh isn't going to listen, and God knows that Pharaoh is going to say no, and God knows that this is going to be his opportunity to display his power to this people, not only the Israelites, but also the Egyptian. And we find out later on when they're about to go into their promised land, who else has heard about God's power? All the other nations have. The, those in Jericho are shaking in their boots because they have heard about the mighty deliverance of the, of the Hebrew God. And so God is doing something that is going to have a generational effect, not just on the Israelites, but on the Egyptians and on the other nation, and that is going to be uh, essentially providing fear and access and proof that he is God for generations to come. So that, that is part of what's going on here. But I have always found it interesting that while God's plan repeatedly is bring the children of Israel out, 
Moses stair steps this thing. He, polit- you know, he, he, gets, he plays the political game, maybe you could argue. Or he is, he's finding a way of making the request more palatable and knowing that that's not the end of what his request is. And so that, I, I've always just found that interesting. Keith? So God does tell Moses to pray for the Okay. 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 Uh, but, and then God realizes that he knows exactly how long he's going to go. Um, so I think it's the idea of, you know, both God's supposed to not ask for freedom completely. Uh, and so Pharaoh's refusal to abide by a harmless request, a, a unreasonable request, yeah. I think is kind of the cause for that delay. Um, well, and it's interesting, you keep reading in that same passage. Um, I'll stretch out my hand, I'll perform these signs, but you won't go empty-handed. Y'all are going to take all the jewelry and the gold and the clothing and all of that with you. I mean, it's, uh, uh, it, it is interesting, the whole plan here uh, that, that is presented. Keith? Yeah. 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 Uh, it it's always been interesting. I mean, this whole this whole chain of events and how it all happens and the the hardening of Pharaoh's heart and even the the emphasis in scripture of why is Pharaoh's heart hard? God made it hard. So even there, I mean, you've got this whole uh, you know, God's role even in the nose. You know, he, he's not just in the, in the role of what Moses is doing, but he's, in the, he's affecting the response of Pharaoh also. Uh, and there's different ideas on, you know, just how far do you take that with God's controlling of Pharaoh. But, uh, but it is interesting to see that. Randy and then Keith. Yeah, why why do you even send me if it's going to work out like this? Yeah, uh, so I mean again, <clears throat> Moses's expectations as to how this should work are definitely different than the way it does work. Uh, but God also is I mean God's pretty clear all the way through. He's going to keep saying no. Just just know that more no's are coming, and uh, things are going to get difficult before they get better. Uh, but that's okay. Keith? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it isn't, I mean, as you continue reading through the story, there are times when Pharaoh wants to say yes, but then he comes back and says, I mean, how many times does Pharaoh say, okay, if you'll relent the plague, I'll let you go. And then as soon as the plague is gone, what's Pharaoh say? Psych! You know, like, he just, uh, uh, he, he pulls back on that. Run. Mm-hmm. I'm absolutely, absolutely, uh, and, and again, it's I, I don't. 
God is more than capable of making Pharaoh do something that Pharaoh doesn't want to do. I don't know that that's the case. I don't know that that's what's being said. I think he's taking, you know, maybe something like what Keith said of a ideal circumstance and, you know, well, of course, no, no sane person would have said, oh, sure, the uh, entire slave population can leave. Yeah, uh, well, we don't care. You know, like, it makes no sense to make that argument. Uh, and, and so I, I think you're you're dealing with uh, probably what was the right human logic thing to say, probably what went along maybe with Pharaoh's arrogance, and there are some character flaws in there what, that would have caused this. Um, all sorts of things. Now, that being said, God most definitely puts him in a situation where all of a sudden, okay, the right thing is to let them go. Like, we cannot argue for this anymore. Keith? Mm-hmm. And I should obey him. Mm-hmm. He doesn't have the idea of the mission of over God. He, he knows works, he knows violence, etc. If most said come to him and say, I know God said that that should happen, so I believe him. So this is just something that, you know, in the early in days of human history, God told me to do so was absolutely for two reasons. Yeah. 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 So you'll find both in literature, but you see this a lot in scripture. As soon as somebody says, well, who is God? They find out real quick. Like, you know, it reminds me of Daniel where Nebuchadnezzar in the chapter three is, who is the God that can save you from the fiery furnace? Mm, you're about to meet him. Like, <laughs> that's where the story is going. As soon as you ask that question, you're going to find out who God is. And that, uh, any, that, that is a very typical um, literary technique to call into question something that is about to happen. Uh, but what's interesting about Scripture is it's announced that it's going to happen before it ever happens. You know, I, I am going to make myself known is what God says. So who is God? You're about to find out. And, and that's what you see as you start going through the story. All right, so uh, the children of Israel are further oppressed, right? Um, Pharaoh does not like the request that Moses is making. And so Pharaoh essentially says, okay, fine. They have to continue to produce the same amount of work and product they've been producing, but we're not going to give them the materials to do it. They've got to go gather their materials and make the brick. And if they don't get that done, well, then they are going to be punished severely because of it. That, of course, makes the, you know, the, the going gets tough and the people start complaining. That's the way it worked with the Israelites. And that is a very, you kind of get an introduction to their um, societal personality in, in, in this story, where they immediately something goes wrong, they start complaining. Now, that being said, before we give them too bad of a, of a, of a rap, we do the same thing. You know, things don't go just right, and all of a sudden we're sitting there shaking our fist at the heavens going, where are you? Why aren't you there? Why aren't you doing for me what I think you should be doing for me? Because it's all about me. Uh, and, and I think there's, a, again, some good application there for us. Remember, when God is at work, our job is to sit back and let God do his work. Right, and and so there there's there's a, a principle there. So uh, interesting. Randy brought up at the end of chapter five, you've got Moses frustrated. 
Moses is like, what, what in the world? Why is this happening? If this is the way you are going to make this work, why in the world am I, you know, why, why did you ever even send me? And God replies, you know, chapter 6, verse 1, now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of a strong hand, he will let them go. And because of a strong hand, he will drive them from his land. So then, of course, you get into this, these great statements of God. I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty. But I was not known by them or to them by the, my name, the Lord. Okay? I, I bring this up because I have taught before in this class that it is very possible that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were not monotheistic. Okay, that they still believed in the other gods. That God is consistently through the book of Genesis called God Most High, which implies what? God's less high, right? Now he does essentially attach himself to that group of people as their God, as their primary God. But here, God is essentially recognizing that when what he says here to Moses. I appeared to them, but I was not really known yet by my real name. I was not known yet for who I really am. They just knew me as a God. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land they lived in uh, as aliens. Furthermore, I heard the groanings of the Israelites, and I've come to remember my covenant. Therefore, tell the Israelites, I am the Lord. I will bring you out of forced labor. I will rescue you from slavery through great acts of judgment. I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. Now, again, interesting. When does that finally happen? Not until Exodus 19. And what's interesting is it's worded exactly like that when you get over to Exodus 19. I will be your God and you will be my people. Okay? And by saying I will be your God, he's not saying I will be a God. I will be your only God. And do you not see that in the Ten Commandments as they are delivered? Okay? I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. Now, again, I don't think God is in saying that, saying there are other gods. He's saying that they no longer have a right to follow any other god, uh, supposed god, as if they are gods, because now they have their god. God has shown himself capable of both providing and protecting and delivering and being the god of this people. Uh, keep reading here, verse 7. You will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the forced labor of, each, of the Egyptians. I will bring you to the land that I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. And so that's what Moses tells the Israelites. Okay? And thus begins the, essentially, that is the statement God makes to the Israelites to say, trust me. Trust me. What you're about to see will be proof that I am qualified to be your God. And that, we've talked about that just a couple of, of classes ago. There's a lot of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy that is focused on the theme of God proving his qualities and revealing his character and showing the people that he is capable of being the God, or being their God. And there's a lot of, of just him revealing himself. This story of the Exodus really is the story, at least chapters 1 through 20, is the story of God revealing himself as God. Because up until this point, what's been their exposure? Nothing. Nothing. When you start piecing the story together, how much work has, do, has God done to prove himself to this people? Nothing. Up until this point. 
With Abraham, you got a couple of strange stories. In Jacob, you've got a couple of strange stories. But even those stories that you have are more visions and messages. They're not proofs of power or proofs of God's ability. Uh, you've got essentially, you know, you go back to the story of Abraham. How miraculous and supernatural is that story? Do what? Yeah. I mean, that's bizarre. But childbirth as a whole is a pretty, still a natural, I mean, it's not virgin birth. I mean, so, I mean, it still could be, uh, again, they don't understand um, uh, anatomy quite the way we do. Uh, you know, so, I mean, you, you've, I, I would assume there's some understanding. You know, menopause is still menopause. You know, you, you've got that, that kind of, you know, they knew Sarah was beyond childbearing years. Uh, but it, it's one of those things of, I mean, Abraham had more children by Keturah just years later. Uh, and, and so even there, you've got, uh, you've got the vision of God passing through the animal carcasses, or the, the lamp passing through the animal carcasses. So maybe that's a miraculous thing. You've got Jacob's dream. You've got the wrestling with the stranger that changed Jacob's name, and he, he now recognized that that was God. But, I mean, uh, as a whole, you don't have the parting of the Red Seas, right? You don't have those kind of stories in Genesis. God has not revealed himself yet until here. And what we have in these early chapters of Exodus is an incredible revelation that God is God, and and that is to me. I, I don't want that to be missed as we dig through this. I saw a hand over, Randy. Another way of looking at it is the mouth. God is there, and the mouth is there. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I would add one more step in there, because I like the way you're dividing that up. I would add one more step in there of God is a covenant maker through Genesis 12 and following. God is a covenant prover here in the early chapters of Exodus. And when you get to chapter 20 and the deliverance of the law, then God becomes, again, the covenant um, keeper. Uh, he, he, this is the covenant we're going to keep together. Uh, and, and so, but there has to be a God proving his side of the deal. You know, if God's side of the deal is, I will be your God, you will be my people. They need to know what kind of God they are aligning themselves with or attaching themselves to. And God proves that, does he not? He proves it well. He proves himself more powerful than the gods of Egypt. And that, we've already talked about that. Exodus chapter 12, verse 12. There's another passage over um, Numbers chapter 33. You'll turn over there, Numbers 33. And a little summary passage about the, the, the traveling, the travel log of the Israelites as they're going from their, you know, the different places that they go. It says here, chapter three, chapter 33, verse 3, they traveled from Ramesses in the first month, on the 15th day of the month. On the day after the Passover, the Israelites went out defiantly in the sight of all the Egyptians. Meanwhile, the Egyptians were burying every firstborn male the Lord had struck down among them, for the Lord had executed judgment against their gods. So we've got chapter 12, Exodus 12 that says God's going to do it. Here in chapter 33, it says God did it. 
God proved himself more powerful than their gods. And that's impressive. And you've got to remember the children of Israel have been in, in Egypt for how long? 400 plus years. How many generations is that? Don't you assume a generation is 20 years? You know, you're going to be 20 years or so before you have children. How many sections of 20 years are in 400 years? A bunch. I'm glad you can do math better than I can. 20. 20 generations, if you want to think of it that way. Okay? 20 generations. It's a lot of generations. You, you've got here this, this idea of, you know, they have generation after generation after generation been told to trust in a God who appeared to my great, 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 grandpa? Right? That's my God. The one way back then. How easy is it going to be to put your trust in that? Especially when that God from way back when promised a land that we're not in anymore and we're enslaved, so clearly he hasn't been effective or helped us at all because we're the ones oppressed. Like, it, it's one of those, I, I mean, you, you put yourself... Also, how much influence do you think the Egyptians have had on the children of Israel in 400 years? A lot. A lot. Do what? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and, and so again, it's one of those, there's a lot of unteaching that needs to be done, a lot of proving that needs to be done, a lot of work that God has to do here to, and, and I understand what I mean by this, to qualify himself to even be their God. Now, God is God. I'm not saying that God has to prove himself to us, but I think God sees the necessity of doing it for them. And so he does that. And so we, we haven't even gotten into the place. I've got to start moving forward. Ron? Yeah, I mean, if they've been trusting in the Egyptian gods and now this God, Yahweh, I am who I am, has proven himself to be stronger and more powerful and for this people, right? Because he delivered this people. Well, he's better than all those gods and he wants us. Yeah, he can be my God. Uh, I think that's exactly what he's doing. He, you know, he proves himself to all the nations, but he is proving himself for this nation. Uh, and, and that makes a, a big difference. Logan? Yes. 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 You know, when God told Moses, I'm going to destroy them and start over with you, had that been me, I would have been like, yes, finally. <laughs> like, I mean, uh, yeah, give Moses, we're going to give Moses a lot of credit through this story because he is, in my opinion, one of the most impressive men of history. Uh, he, 
Yes, uh, yes. So in, incredible. All right, I've got to get to the plagues real quick. All right, uh, and and again, I wanted to spend more time on what we've talked about today because I know we've studied the plague, we've looked at the plague. Uh, I didn't even because I'm I'm intentionally not using PowerPoint this this quarter. I don't know why I made that decision, but I did. And um, uh, you know, I've put up charts before about how different aspects of the plague would have corresponded to different Egyptian gods. Now, that being said, Egyptians had dozens, if not well over a hundred different gods in their mythology and their theology. Uh, so God's not literally, specifically attacking every single one with a plague or some sort of symbolism. Uh, God is showing, essentially, the way that they believed in their gods is that their gods' job was to interfere in nature was to interfere in the natural course of events. And so when the river flooded and they needed, you know, they needed that water for their crops, that came from the gods because the gods made that flood happen and the gods made that flood recede and the god made the, the pestilence disappear whenever it disappeared. And the god brought the pestilence because it was judgment. And that, so they would see the natural course of events and, and things that would happen as the functions and works of God. Here's what's interesting about the plagues. That the reason the plagues show that God's power was over their God's powers was that it was announced, predicted, and then stopped by the words of God's messenger. Okay? It's not the plague itself that points to God. It's the fact that the plague was controlled by God's messenger. Controlled. Okay? So when Moses comes in and he does, you know, Aaron sticks his staff in the water and it makes the water turn to blood, and not just the water of the Nile turn to blood, but what else? The water in the wooden bowls sitting on the table of the house turned to blood. Like it, it was, it was a thorough, there's no natural explanation as to how that happened other than the gods made that happen. Well, which god made that happen? Well, the reason we know it was Moses' God is because Moses announced it and then he made it happen. And then whenever Pharaoh relented or repented, Moses could cause it to stop happening. Do you see why that makes a difference? Because again, when it came to water turning to blood, who else did that? The Egyptian magicians. How? I don't know. People like to make a big argument that it was all trickery and sleight of hand and all that. We don't know. It said they did it by their secret arts. I don't know what that means. Uh, could they have had some sort of supernatural or access to supernatural power? There are other forces and the spiritual forces out there that are not God. Could they have been functioning the, by the power of the devil, to put it in our terms of our modern Christianity? Yes, it could have. Okay? So uh, that, that uh, again, I, I, I'm not going to sit around and debate what we very clearly don't understand as far as how that happened. They also made frogs show up. Now here's my question. Wouldn't Pharaoh have wanted them to make the frogs disappear? not show up I mean do you see where that that doesn't quite accomplish the task of Pharaoh you know had they been able to make the frogs disappear after God made the frogs show up what would that have shown that their gods were equal okay makes me think back to the uh you know, all those Disney cartoons that I grew up watching, like Sword in the Stone, and you've got Merlin fighting against um, uh, the, the witch at the end. I can't remember her name. There you go, Madam Mim, and uh, they're fighting against each other. But, I mean, this guy's his power is equal to her power, and they're back and forth the whole time. What do you never see in this exchange of power? There's never equalness, ever. Uh, when the... Staffs are thrown on the ground. What do you find at the end of that episode? 
Aaron's staff slash serpent ate their staff slash serpent, right? Which showed this God is better than that God, right? They both made water turn to blood. But had they been able to turn the blood back to water, that would have been that would have been equal power in contrast. But they don't do that. Moses makes frogs show up. They can't make the frogs disappear. They just make frogs show up. And then you get to the third one. Okay, third plague is what? Lice, maybe. We're not really sure what the Hebrew words mean there for the plague three and four. Bugs of some sort, okay? And, and the, Pharaoh calls in his magicians, and what does it say about them? They couldn't do it. Their powers were exhausted, okay? They weren't able to match that. And so you've got here, again, this idea of uh, their limitation, that they're not, you know, verse, uh, chapter 8, verse 18, the magicians tried to produce gnats using their occult practices, but they could not. The gnats remained on people and animals. Okay, so again, it's one of those, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of tapped out at this point. Okay, uh, number four, you've got the, the flies. Uh, some sort of uh, another sort of insect that we're not really sure what the Hebrew word means there, but another annoyant, maybe even uh, a, a painful, like a biting fly of some sort. Uh, then you've got the death of the livestock. But again, like I said earlier, the God's job was to interfere with nature. That's what their job was. Their job was to make natural things happen out of order or make natural things happen at the at the request of those who have access to the power of the gods and at this point these people could not access their god's powers anymore but moses could okay moses here lord said chapter 9 lord said to moses go do this thing uh, and and cause this to happen um, then the uh, Lord set a time saying, tomorrow the Lord will do this thing in the land. Verse 6, the Lord did this the next day. So again, Moses announces it, and then it happens. And when it happens, it's devastating. Like it is, it is a thorough thing. The other thing you notice is oftentimes, it doesn't always point this out, but oftentimes it only happens to the Egyptians. It does not happen to the Israelites. Right, And so now you've got even a greater indication that, oh, the Israelite flocks over there, they're still healthy. You know, do you think the Egyptians noticed that? Absolutely. Uh, and so again, you see that, that power. Uh, plague number six in chapter nine, you've got the boils that come, uh, you know, and, and people are getting covered with boils, including... Um, <laughs> I love the way it words this. Verse 10 and 11. So they took furnace soot and stood before Pharaoh. Moses threw it toward the heaven, and it became festering boils on the people and animals. The magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boils were on the magicians as well as all of the Egyptians. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Do you see that like... Now, the magicians are not only shown as being not powerful or having no access to gods whose power equaled the God of Moses, but now the magicians themselves are being adversely affected by the God of Moses. Uh, so we've got God showing his power over their gods and their God's servants, right? So again, it's just kind of funny the way it builds this whole thing. Seventh plague is hail. Uh, gets up early in the morning, presents yourself to Pharaoh. Again, how do you control what comes out of the sky? Right? I mean, it's, it's one thing. Maybe there was poison in the soot that he threw up, and they have somehow covertly figured out a way to... Um, um, cause this to happen all over the land of Egypt. But you can't control what falls out of the heavens, 
There's only one explanation for something falling out of the heaven. And it's God. Right? And so, God, again, all of these plagues are escalating. The power that is shown is escalating. The amount of control that God has escalates. The amount of effect that it has on the people is escalating. What do you find by the time you get to this point? What the Egyptians respond? So, I'm trying to remember if it's this one or if it's by the time you get to Locust and the next couple. But the Egyptians start crying out against Pharaoh to let the people go. Like they, they see what the right answer is, even though Pharaoh's heart is hardened. Um, so, again, you see this being a, a, a continual uh, battle through this whole thing. Uh, next plague, locust comes in, wipes out the crops. The uh, last plague is darkness, or not the last one. The ninth plague is darkness. last one we're going to talk about today is darkness. And do what? 10 verse 7. Okay, Pharaoh's officials ask, how long are you going to let this man be a snare to us? I mean, the, everybody else is going, come on, please let them go. Get this, like, we're tired of this. Uh, and we don't really know how long these plagues lasted uh, as far as how much time was between the plagues. Uh, was this something that happened over the course of 30 days or is this something that happened over the course of six months? Or how much of a break did Moses give in between the plagues? Uh, just, just all of that is not laid out for us. But it is constant enough that the people are exhausted. Okay, we would imagine there's some breaks in there because of the, uh, like the death of the livestock, but then later on you read of more livestock, right? I mean, so you, you know, the boils, uh, in that the boils also end up showing up on the livestock, um, and, but the previous plague was the death of all the livestock. So, you know, there, there has to be some sort of time frame in there that allows for that, both of those to be true. Uh, but you get to the last pl or the the ninth plague, and it says that he stretched out his hand toward the heaven, and there was a thick darkness throughout the land of Egypt for three days. One person could not see another; it was completely dark. Yet the Israelites had light where they lived. You think you're going to notice that? What is it Jesus teaches? You're a light of, of uh, you're the light of the world. A city. What's it say? A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. When you see light from the darkness, it is noticeable. Okay? Now you're out there where I live, and certain nights you can see which direction Birmingham is. You know why? One side of the sky is lit up, the other side is not. Right? I mean, you, you can see the difference. You can see the way that works. Um, and again, I'm not sure is that, you know, what is the thick darkness? Is that just regular darkness that was just really deep darkness, like when we've got a new moon? Or was it a, almost like a blindness that came on all the Egyptians so they really couldn't see anything? I will say they did know Israelites still had light. The Egyptians did not. And I would imagine that there, there was a certain miraculous, uh, they tried to light a fire in the middle of, the, of their, their little community square. No fires would be lit. No lamps would burn. There was no source of light from the skies, from that man-made, any of it. It was gone. They had darkness for three days. And, uh, and that makes it pretty uh, noticeable. Ron? Yeah, no hail in Goshen. Yeah, livestock survived in Goshen. Like it, it, uh, all of this, all the Israelites were protected from this. Keith? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So they could still light lamps over there. Like, you know, you still, you still had light over there. So, 
Um, so, so again, I, I find that to be remarkable. Like that, that would have been an incredibly noticeable uh, difference. You know, Logan? Mm. Yes. Yep. Oh, yeah. So now Moses has that that threat hanging over his head again. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, we'll uh, start with chapter twelve on um, on Wednesday. Thank you.